Pastor Candy and I, we greet you from the East Coast here in Norfolk, Virginia. It was our plan. It was our plan and our intention and our expectation to be with you today in person. But our airline, unbeknownst to us, imposed an alternate itinerary on us at the last minute yesterday, which meant that we cannot possibly get home until sometime tomorrow, hopefully. Well, welcome to the second part of It's Time to Prove It. Paul wrote to the believers in Rome who were seeking the kingdom and the will of God being done where they were. In Romans 12, 2, he wrote, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Another version says, have a new mind. Then you will prove for yourselves what God wants you to do. We can draw some conclusions from this for us personally, but also for our church as well. And one of those is that it's time for God to change the way we think. One version says, let God remold our minds. And another conclusion we can draw is that it's time to prove the kingdom for ourselves here, where we live, where we worship, where we shop, and the places that we frequent. The word prove means to show that it's genuine, to put something to the test, that it might be demonstrated. So it really is time for us to step in and step up and step out. Why? Well, Paul wrote this concerning the kingdom in 1 Corinthians 4.20. He said, the kingdom of God, you see, isn't about talk, it's about power not talk, but a demonstration of the spirit and of power. So since we profess the kingdom, it's time to prove it, to make way for a demonstration of the kingdom. Now, according to Paul, it looks like that's going to require a change in the way we think, possibly in several areas. Last week, we explored one of those that we just defined as the structure, the structure of the body or the church, because God has given a divine structure. And in Ephesians 4, 16, the Bible says he makes the whole body fit together and unites us through the support of every joint. And then he says this, as each and every part does its job, he makes the body grow. So there is this strategic placement of each and every part where every person has a place, a part, a share, and a function. And each part then helps bring the fullness of Christ and the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So your part matters, your place matters, your passion matters, and your portion matters, the grace and ministry that God has given you matters, the input and the investment, and your faith matters. So the structure of the body of the church is essentially this. Every part counts, every part matters, every part helps, every part brings and channels the kingdom to where that particular part is. Now, we mentioned last week some undeniable truths that should really alter our thinking. And one of those was God has no favorites. There are none that are superior and therefore none that are inferior. There are none who have the big Jesus and then some who have the little Jesus. And you know, it, it is almost like a religious Marxism, that kind of thinking where everyone is equal, but some are more equal. So I should never say, well, they can, but I can't. They should, but I shouldn't. And they have more and therefore they're able and I'm not so able when all of us are fully favored by God. Another one of those truths is that God has shared his fullness, not mere scraps or crumbs. John said it this way in John 1 16, for out of his fullness, we have all received 
one grace after another and spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing and even favor upon favor and gift heaped upon gift. So whatever limits and restrictions and exclusions and inabilities that I may wrongly identify with, they're not part of the divine structure. So we are all then carriers of his fullness. And one other little truth that we examine, God has declared all of us fit, we're qualified, we're eligible, we're enabled, we are strong enough, we have already made the cut, and all of this uh, means that we are up for whatever God is into. And since all of these things are true, then the moment that I begin to think that I'm in a lesser place or a lower place, then I begin to inhibit the kingdom from coming where I am. So there must be a change in the way we think about God's divine structure and our amazing place in that structure. But also another area that I would like for you to consider today is what I call the area of the strange. The strange, yes, that's right. In Luke 5, 26, there were some people who encountered the kingdom of God for the very first time. And this was their response. This is what they said. The Bible says they were all amazed and they praised God and they were filled with fear saying, now listen to what they said. Doubtless, we have seen strange things today. Strange things. In the original language, it is the word paradoxus, where we get our word paradox from. And it means that which is unexpected, that which is uncommon. We've seen something that's contrary to our expectation, it's extraordinary. Now, this doesn't mean weird or creepy. Uh, some of the other versions translate it like this, incredible, unimaginable, unbelievable, unthinkable, remarkable, amazing. Even one says the things that we can hardly believe. So it is possible that what might seem strange or uncharacteristic or out of the ordinary or unusual, a bit off the radar, can come my way as a follower of Jesus, and it can actually end up being God, a word, a prompting, an impulse, an insight, a stirring. Strange, yes, but it's God. And you say, well, why does this happen? How is this possible? Well, I wanna give you a statement. I think it's worth jotting down. I think it's worth noting, and it's definitely worth remembering. And it is this, God tends to not look like God when he appears to us as God. I'm gonna repeat that. God tends to not look like God when he appears to us as God. So logically then, if I only ever accept and allow and accommodate what is familiar to me and comfortable for me and safe and explainable, what you might wanna call definable Christianity. Pastor Buddy, what is definable Christianity? Well, it is when we say, uh, I'm a Christian, but everything in my life is explainable, it's all comfortable and it's all safe. Well, if that's what I choose, I'm going to end up minimizing and even missing the kingdom in so many ways. You know, we tend to shy away from and dismiss that which appears to be a bit strange. In fact, in the New Testament, in Jerusalem, there was a place that was called the potter's field. And the Bible says it was used to bury strangers. So if it was strange to them, or they didn't know what to do with it, they just bury it. Now, we mustn't bury what's strange to us because it could be God. For instance, in, in Genesis 18.1, there is a, a verse of scripture that says, the Lord showed himself to Abraham by the oak trees as he sat at the tent door in the heat of the day. Now, 
This particular verse gives us a lot of information, but it doesn't help Abraham at all. Abraham had no idea of what we know from verse number one. So then there is a verse two. And in verse two, it says, Abraham looked up and he saw three men standing in front of him. That's right, three men. Now, I ask you, does that resemble God to you? I mean, where are the flashes of lightning? Where's the glow of glory? Where's the sound of the trumpets? Where's the shaking? Where are the angel voices and the heavenly hosts and the chariots and the white horses? You see, Abraham only saw three strange men on foot and they were totally unknown to him. And there was nothing about their clothing or their appearance or their manner that indicated this is God. So verse number two, the rest of verse two says, when he saw them, he ran. A 90 something year old man, he ran from the tent door to meet them. And he put his face to the ground and said, my Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, please do not pass by your servant. What a statement, what a prayer that we could pray. Please do not let the kingdom of God pass us by. And that's the key right there, how Abraham welcomed what must have been very strange, but thinking this could possibly be God. You know, there is a similar experience that Gideon had in Judges 6, 11. The Bible simply says the angel of the Lord came, and then there's a period. And then this next statement, he sat down under an oak tree. When the angel of the Lord came, it was the appearance of an ordinary man sitting under a tree. There was nothing to indicate that this was God. And even Gideon initially addresses him as sir, as he would any other man. But it was in fact the Lord. Nothing indicated that it was God. In fact, the man's appearance and manner would have been probably the opposite of what Gideon would have expected from God. Now, the reason that this strangeness is part of our Christian experience is because it's the way of God. It's the way God is. Moses spoke to the people in Deuteronomy 4, verse 12, and this is what he said, the Lord spoke to you from the fire. You heard the sound of someone speaking, but you did not see any form. There was only a voice. And three verses later, he says this, on the day the Lord spoke to you from the fire, you did not see him. And then this statement, there was no shape for God. There was no shape for God. No shape, no form, no image, no outline. Why? Because God has no standard form. He has no set likeness. He has no particular shape. He has no predictable image. He's not tied to any form because forms by their very nature impose limits, and they narrow our field of vision, and they curtail our expectation, and they end up causing us to unwisely define God, who is indefinable, and to limit him, who is limitless. In the Garden of Eden, God came as a voice. There was no shape, there was no form, no image, and we must be open to what could be considered strange and beyond our limited expectation. Not weird, just outside the normal, the usual, the ordinary. There must be a change in the way we think about the strange. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to take that on, to change the way you think? The strange. And then there is one other, and that is the supernatural. The supernatural 
is our rightful realm. It is our normal realm as believers. It's the realm of the Spirit. It's the realm of God. It's where the Spirit is moving and working, and it is where the kingdom is coming. You see, we are spiritual beings who have been made alive and seated with Christ and positioned with him. We are his brethren. We are clothed with his spirit and power and anointing. The supernatural realm, put another way, is our home field. It's our home turf. But the lie of the enemy comes and tells us that the supernatural realm is way above us. It's way beyond us. It's unreachable. It is unattainable. When in fact, it's already ours. You know, early on, God got Samson used to the higher realm of the supernatural and to the moving in supernatural strength. In Judges 13, 25, the Bible says the spirit of the Lord began to stir him in the camp of Dan. Other versions say to move him at times, to direct him or rouse him or began to work in Samson or to work through him. He was being awakened to the realm of the spirit and to the supernatural. Why the supernatural? Because there are no natural answers for the challenges, for the defeats, for the predicaments, for the problems, for the needs of our natural life. People need something higher than what flesh and blood can offer them. Jeremiah said this to God in chapter 10, verse 23 of his prophetic book. He said, I know God that mere mortals can't run their own lives that men and women don't have what it takes to take charge of life. People need a supernatural God, and our God is the God of the supernatural. His kingdom is a supernatural kingdom. Just before a great supernatural work of God that would take God's people into a new place and bring the kingdom to the forefront. Joshua gave the priests this simple instruction. In Joshua 3.8, he said, when you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop. Take a few small steps into the river. I believe that's a invitation for us today from the Lord himself. Take a few steps into the river of the supernatural. Nothing big, nothing grand, nothing radical, nothing earth-shaking, just a few steps. Be open to making a way for the supernatural expression of God through your life. We must change the way we think about the supernatural and our kingdom experience, and we must do it today. So remember, we all have a place. We have a part. We have a portion, and we have his power, which is greater than any other power. Everyone counts. Everyone matters. Everyone brings the kingdom where they are, and we are all favored in God. And we all will encounter that which is strange. You can mark it down. You can bank on it, just like Abraham and just like Gideon. And we must be ready to welcome it, because every time we do, it will bring the kingdom. And we all have been placed, all of us, in a supernatural realm, a supernatural dimension, this supernatural kingdom that we're part of. And I believe that we're in a supernatural season 
and it's ours to receive and it's ours to act upon. So it's time. It's time for us to prove the kingdom one day at a time, one decision, one act, one victory at a time. It's time to prove the kingdom where we are today, where you are, where I am. Are you ready? Well, let's begin with just those few steps, like step one. I choose to change the way I have been thinking about my place in the kingdom. Are you ready to do that? Let's take that step today. Step two, I will no longer carry an insufficient, inadequate image of who my God really is. I'll no longer ignore and bury what seems strange, knowing that it just might be God on the move around me. I can take that step today. I serve a big God. He is limitless. He is without bounds. And he is sufficient in all things. Even when it appears strange, that just might be God. And the third small step, I'm a servant of Jesus in this supernatural kingdom with full access to God's supernatural provision and power. I expect to see the kingdom come, not just talk, but power, a demonstration of the spirit and of power. So I'll take these small steps today, right now, determined never to turn back because it's high time for the kingdom to come here where we are. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you have called us to this place where we are, that this is our divine opportunity to lay hold of your promises, to see the kingdom come and your will to be done where we are, where we are individually and where we are as a church, I thank you today that you have given us these promises and that you have awakened us to this structure that you have set up, that we're all favored. We all have a place and a part, and it is an important part in the functioning and in the processing of the body and for the kingdom to come. I thank you today that even though things might seem strange, that we can change the way we think and welcome that which might seem strange because we would know that God, our God, is on the move, that he's breaking us out of that which is the norm, which is the routine, which is what we've gotten used to, and that you are introducing that which is strange to us so that we might Take a detour, get off the beaten path, and discover how amazing you are in the midst of your kingdom coming. And I thank you today that you have put us in a supernatural kingdom and that you have placed us as supernatural beings at your disposal and that you are willing to demonstrate your kingdom through us, as we just take a few steps, a few steps, one at the time, to see your kingdom come. We can do this. We choose today. We choose to change the way we think, to accommodate all that you are, O oh God and all that you desire to do in these crucial times 
in these last days, in these important moments. And to you, we give the glory and the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. It's been good to be together. And we look forward to getting back with you and all that God has promised us. God bless you. Have a great day.